Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, it takes a little bit to haul oneself and one's body across what's actually a fairly large pond. Um, I come from the Rocky Mountains in Montana, where I am surrounded by an incredible amount of heritage, of biodiversity. Uh, I have moose and black bear and wolves and coyotes and grizzly bear literally in my backyard. Um, but yet I live just three miles from downtown. And it's quite a, quite a leap, really, to move from one part of the world where Euro-American impacts have been limited to the last 200 years to another part of the world where the impacts have several thousand years. But nevertheless, independent of my version of wild and your version of wild, there's an incredible amount of richness and heritage that we all collectively have inherited, no matter where we call our homes. And it is in this richness and heritage that we can find an incredible opportunity for how we, as just one of the species on the planet, can move forward and live here for the long haul, live here sustainably. And part of that heritage begins with taking a closer look, literally, at what is just outside our back doors. This is my son, and this particular dragonfly, unfortunately, um, rather rapidly had an encounter with a window in our house. And uh, for a brief moment in its stunned state, we were able to do a fabulous photo shoot with my kids and the, and the dragonfly. But what I appreciate most about this is that it took no encouragement whatsoever to get my son to get a close-up look of what was happening right there in its very his own backyard, um, to have that sense of wonder that we have forgotten often as adults, that we can have that connection with the natural world. Because, you know, there is one thing that we all hold in common, and that is that we live on this glorious place known as Earth. And Earth has been around for quite a long time, 4.5 billion years to be exact. And of course, billion is, um, is it actually a really big number. <laughs> but when we talk about deficits of, you know, trillion, um, then billion doesn't sound so big. But I want to put it into perspective for you. If we take the age of the Earth and compress it into one year, so that January 1st is the birth of the Earth, just past midnight, and right now we're standing on December 31st, just a breath before midnight. That's four and a half billion years squished into one year. Well, the first two months, January and February, was just the primordial soup, right? That, that like mass of lava and rock and steam and chemicals and not much happening. And life shows up actually on, on March 1st, which is 3.85, whoops, let me back up here, 3.85 billion years ago. And that's when we have the first single-celled organisms. So, Life shows up March 1st, and March, April, May, June, July, and August, we have only single-celled organisms dominating the planet. And it's not until September 1st that sex happens. Long time to wait. And cells start coming together, and you have multicellular organisms that start reproducing. Um, and you start rapid, rapid evolution after that. You had land plants and fish and amphibians. The reptiles, right, dominated this world the dinosaurs ruled the entire planet for a very, very long period of time. And they disappeared a really long time ago, right? Long time. Well, actually, December 25th, at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, is when that asteroid hit the planet. And we saw the, the era of the dinosaurs decline. Humans, all right, our first two-legged ancestors, hominids, have only been on the planet for about five hours. Five hours are our deepest ancestors. And Homo sapiens sapiens, our species, right, of which there's almost seven billion of us, have been here for about four and a half minutes of that entire year. And the entire Industrial Revolution, which for all practical purposes defines life as we know it, and when we go and we say, where are we going to get ideas? And how is technology going to save us? And where do we fit in? We look to what we've all created in the last 
three quarters of a second. Three quarters of a second is all that we've really, really been here as a species, having the impact that we have. But there's a couple of things that are true of this planet, and they've been true for the last four and a half billion years. One is that it's a water-based planet. Right? We know that life needs water. Water is critical. We go out into the stars and we look for water on other planets because it's that essential. And that's what makes our Earth so unique. But it's pretty clear if aliens were to fly over and watch how we treat water, they would never realize how incredibly precious and sacred it is to our very survival. Right? This water-based planet, always been that way, always will be that way. Another thing that's true about this planet is, well, it is subject to the laws of conservation of energy and matter, right? That there are real limits and boundaries. And as much as we'd like to imagine that we can succumb and, and overcome and, and break any walls that might be in front of us, we really actually can't defy the laws of physics, right? And here's a really good example of a limit. This blue marble that's sitting on the globe right now, that blue marble represents all of the water on the planet, all of it, all the oceans, all of the fresh water, all of the frozen water, all of the water that's between the interstitial grains of sand, right? That's all the water. That's a pretty significant limit for a planet in which water is so critical to all of life. The white ball on the, on the right, your right, that's our atmosphere. That's the sum total of the atmosphere in which we are pumping our carbon dioxide and our methane and all of the other pollutants that we don't want here, so we think if we pump it up there, it'll be away. Well, the laws of it, uh, conservation of energy and matter tell us that there really is actually no away. Right? This planet is our home. Another thing that's true about the planet is it's in a state of dynamic non-equilibrium. And that's a really fancy way of just saying things change. And they change always and constantly they're changing. So I liken it to a bowl, all right? And in the bottom of that bowl would be an equilibrium state. And if you put something in the bowl, it would settle to the bottom of that bowl. But the challenge is, is that that bowl is always shifting. It's always moving. And so what life has learned to do in all this, these eras is to build itself round. All right? To be round so that it doesn't matter where the bottom of the bowl is, it settles and finds its spot, and when the bowl shifts, it settles and finds its spot again. We as a species prefer square, right? And we don't go round, and we try to hold the bowl still. And things like Katrina, and the tsunami, and the earthquake in Haiti, and, cl and climate change remind us that we actually really can't hold the bowl still. It takes an incredible amount of energy to ensure that this room stays a constant 23 degrees C year round. All right, that's trying to hold the bowl still. So life changes, right? And so in this time, 3.85 billion years of evolution, life has had to learn how to live with these operating conditions, right? We too must learn to live with those operating conditions, but they're not necessarily inhibitory. They can actually be incredibly expansive. And so in all this time, life has learned to live in this incredible space. And over these last 10 months, there's an incredible amount of time-tested wisdom that's available to us to actually begin to look to, to ask the question, how do we live here? How do we survive? How have you managed to live here for the last 3.85 billion years so incredibly well?